Thank you for staying with us. And uh, <clears throat> what I suggest, maybe, first of all, um, well, I'll introduce uh, the guests uh, tonight and the partners of the event. Uh, then <clears throat> we could uh, uh, collect some questions you may have uh, on the movie you just watched. And then we will have uh, an open discussion with all of them. So first of all, here on my left, uh, Monica Borgman, who uh, is, mm, is a filmmaker. Uh, and uh, she co-founded uh, Umam Documentation and Research with Lockman Slim. And she um, uh, made two movies with uh, Lockman, Massacre uh, you just watched, and uh, Tadmor, which is a more recent one. <clears throat> Actually, Tadmor is on the reliving uh, of the uh, carceral experiences of uh, um, Lebanese and Syrian inmates in the prison of Tadmor in southeastern Syria. Um, on the left uh, of uh, Monica, Jean Perret, uh, Jean Perret uh, tonight is representing, uh, representing uh, UMAM Switzerland, uh, but uh, actually uh, Jean has been for several years the director of the Vision du Réel uh, Documentary Film Festival in Nyon, and uh, he was the one who in 2004 picked up uh, the movie Massacre, who was shown for the first time in Switzerland. Um, later on, uh, Jean Perret has been uh, the director of the um, Cinema Academy, Cinema du Réel, and the head uh, of Geneva. And uh, on the left of uh, uh, Jean Perret, Catherine Camerman, who is presently uh, vice president of the International Oriental Film Festival of Geneva. Uh, and uh, she has uh, been uh, in the past a journalist working especially on the Middle East. And she had an intimate uh, knowledge about uh, Lebanon and the region uh, where she lived uh, for a long while. And uh, she was uh, very often in contact with uh, Lokman Slim. So, what I suggest is that um, uh, if you have uh, some questions on the movie, we can begin with that. Um, and actually, uh, I will leave the floor to Monica, Jean, and Catherine to answer uh, maybe some of your questions. So p please uh, feel free um, to, if you have questions, just raise the hands. Uh, and there is somebody in the room that will uh, bring you the micro. There are two persons in the room. So... Probably you feel traumatized, <laughs> which I understand perfectly well. So, may... may oh, oh, yes, there is a question over there. Um, yeah, I mean, and of course, it's a bit obviously very shocking, and I, I just wonder about the, if this is my impression, or was it a deliberate way of filming these, these six people in a way that they looked almost barbaric? It, is this, is this, was this sort of, you know, they looked, at some point they had white t-shirts, but then at some point they looked black. Was that sort of a deliberate, um, way of picturing them, or was that sort of a, um, you know, byproduct? It's just interesting because it sort of adds a lot to the effect of what they say somehow throughout the, the, the film. So it's just, just a point of interest. Yeah. Uh, if you agree, and, let's uh, take a few questions yes. maybe, and we can group them, we can answer. There is somebody else over there. Okay, merci. Uh, yes, uh, just a question too about the people who are being uh, interviewed in this uh, in terms of, I mean, we know what they did, but 
what was their circumstances when they were being filmed? It, it looked at some point that as if they were in prison cells, but at other times as if they were in homes. Uh, it would be useful if you could explain to us a little bit uh, where they were and how you encountered them and how was it possible uh, to find people who were willing to talk about it. As a couple of them said, they could not reveal their identity, their faces for fear of uh, revenge attacks against themselves as well as their family. Thank you. I think these are two very good questions to begin with. And uh, maybe I'll give you the floor because uh, you were co-filming with Lockman. <coughs> yes, I mean, I would like to answer first uh, your question. And actually, and I'm sorry for this, but the picture was a little bit too dark today. I mean, it's, uh, it was not meant to be like this. And this gave the impression now you had, uh, which I understand very well, that we try to make them horrific. Uh, actually, uh, we wanted to do exactly the opposite um, to, um, to, yeah, no, to show the human body. And I mean, as we couldn't show their faces, the, the visual principle or the visual language of the film was from the beginning thought to be the body language. And in this sense, I mean, um, we asked the six men if they would have a problem at one point uh, to turn out their shirt, that we really concentrate on the body. Uh, two said they have a problem, so it was fine. The others had, didn't have a problem. But uh, yeah, and really this body language became the aesthetical principle and uh, but I, yeah, and the picture was too dark, so I understand very well your remark, but it was not meant to be like this. Um, to your question, um, uh, it was a very long process to find these people, and uh, it took months. Uh, it was maybe easier than I thought to find them. Uh, what took a lot of time was to build up a kind of confidence. And uh, we made, in the preparation phase, which took months, we made sure that they had participated in the massacre of Sabra and Shatila. Uh, but we let them talk the first time in front of the camera. The camera person was a woman, Nina Menkes, and I think this also helped and uh, to feel, make them feel a bit more comfortable. But also, I mean, I must say, after these months of preparation, uh, they, they had a need to talk, and maybe you got this also uh, from the film. Um, I guess it was the first time they talked in details. I'm not sure they will ever talk again about it. But uh, they had a need to talk, and I still remember that in the editing process, we really had the moment, uh, the problem sometimes, to find, uh, to find quiet moments. And I mean, you have to see the context of the Lebanese civil war. Uh, there was an amnesty law. Uh, there was a kind of tabula rasa, as nothing has happened. So what I'm saying now, I'm not saying it out of pity for these men, but they were somehow in Gimme, they were left alone also with their crimes. So all of a sudden we arrived, we offered them a possibility to talk. It was a very difficult process. We didn't want to become the complices. In the same time, we couldn't be their judges because then they wouldn't have talked to us anymore. So it was a very difficult process, but I think they grabbed this opportunity to talk at one moment about it, and I'm quite sure they never did again, so. And the question of the cell, where do you... Ah, you the cell. No, I mean, these are not cells. Uh, this is, these are different 
anonymous uh, places, but also, and again, I'm sorry for this, uh, they look normally less cellish because there is a little bit more light. And uh, no, and I mean, the person, the only person we filmed at his home was the guy with the two cats. And therefore, also the cats are in the film because uh, they belong to his house, they belong to him. And otherwise, I mean, uh, the civil war in Lebanon is a taboo. Uh, so it was not so easy to find also places where it was possible to film them. Um, it took, was also a kind of research. And uh, we wanted to have anonymous places, not prison cells, but anonymous places that really the whole attention goes to the body language. Uh, have you been surprised tonight that nobody was clapping at the end? It's not the first time. <laughs> I, I understand that because uh, it, 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 it was for me impossible to clap and and, and I, I want and we want to tell you as our admiration to have done this film because it's a completely urgent film to be seen today again and again. Um, and especially because um, you, your way to approach this person, this man, is a way with no arrogance. Actually, you're filming with this camera always on the shoulder, always looking for something focusing, zooming in, out. You, you try to understand uh, what was going on at that time. You try to, in French, de prendre la dimension de l'événement. And uh, I think it's, it's absolutely fascinating how you, you try to, and you, you don't say, we want, we know, we, we try to know, we try to understand. And then in your dramaturgy, uh, at the end, the end is terrible. It, it's, it's, it's terrific. Terrifically terrible, you know, but you, you build up a, a kind of a journey in order for us spectators to understand something and not only to be uh, suffocating by, by, the, by the words and the body language. Could you say something about this, this way to, to try to, to, to see, to hear what is going on with this camera work, which is always looking for something and sometimes missing something, capturing something? You try. Yes, it was a trial. I mean, this film is really a trial uh, <clears throat> through the camera work, through the interviews, to understand uh, the phenomenon of collective violence. What is happening, I mean, there are different forms of violence, and but what is happening in this collective form of violence. And I mean, as much, there are not many questions in the film. I mean, mostly we cut the questions out. Um, but in the same time, we left some in to show also our presence. Um, but I mean, the questions are trying to understand how somebody is also overcoming maybe his own borders and becoming able to do whatever they are describing. And I think the camera is, uh, is trying to do the same, somehow capturing also reactions when, uh, when these men are confronted with photos. I mean, the film is not really showing the photos of the victims but the film is much more showing a kind of confrontation between the perpetrators and the victims. So the, the, the camera is, and I mean, I come back to, to what I said before, that uh, as we couldn't show faces, I mean, we decided the, the body language is becoming uh, the aesthetical principle. So the, the camera is trying to follow also the body, how the body is, uh, is reacting to even the words. Yeah, and sometimes the reaction of the body, it's, it's contradictor, contradictory of what the men are saying. So the camera is in a permanent process of capturing these moments. 
Did you stage some moments? Did you ask for specific ways to, to behave? For the camera? Yeah. Uh, yes, we gave indications. Uh, we, the camera was, uh, was very quiet uh, in, the, in all the description before the camera. These were fixed shots. And the camera started to move when we are coming to the massacre. Yes, I mean, there were indications, of course, but in the same time, there was a lot of improvisation, and it was really the sensibility of Nina Menkes to capture these moments. Could you, uh, could you uh, give us some pictures of you on the set with Lockman? Uh, how did you work together? It was your first, first uh, collaboration, uh, intimate con collaboration. How, how did you work together? Um, uh, I say, uh, well, <laughs> Lokman and me, we met 20 years ago, and uh, this was our first collaboration, as we are saying. And uh, I don't know, it's a little bit difficult to, to describe, but uh, we have always been completing each other, and uh, this started really with this film. Um, I mean, we designed, of course, uh, with Nina, we designed uh, more or less the scenes, uh, we found the places, etc., etc. But uh, when you are in such a situation, we had both this feeling, I mean, uh, with these guys, it's now or never, in a way. And uh, we normally we film three with each one. We film three days, but also we never could be sure that they would come back the next day. I mean, they did so, but I mean we had no guarantee that they would do so. So um, I don't know. There was, uh, yani there were a lot of things, but there was this thirst somehow really on our both sides to understand. Uh, we were sitting during the shooting, during all these interviews, we were sitting always next to each other and actually somehow um, yeah, communicating between us how to, to move forward huh? because there was this kind of urgency. And I think uh, we succeeded also because we were different. I mean, I'm, uh, Lokman is a Lebanese. He was uh, almost the same generation like this guy. He speaks perfectly Arabic. He is a man. I speak a broken Arabic. I'm a woman. I'm a foreigner. So all this, we played, uh, we played these cards. And I mean, I, as a woman, I could ask sometimes much more in a m much more naive way than Lukman could do it because nobody would have believed him this. So we, we played this, but without a kind of planning, it came somehow automatically. Don't know if this answers your question. A, but of course, <laughs> very good. The last remark right now is, um, to, to say how important this film is today, like it was uh, before, to remain that this film has not been shown really in Lebanon, right? No, unfortunately not. This film has been uh, shown only one time officially in Lebanon. This was in September 2005. And since it has been censored, and uh, which is very sad because we had a distributor who tried twice to distribute it really in cinemas, but unfortunately, uh, as films have to pass the general security and the censorship, we didn't get the permission. To be mentioned, the film was co-produced with Switzerland and got an award at the Festival Vision du Réel, the award of the public television of, 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 the, of uh, French-speaking part of Switzerland. Just uh, last word now, uh, many, many Thanks, if I if I may say like that, that so so stupidly, because because in the film uh, you have this deep respect of me, spectator, because of course I'm confronted with these words which are terrible. I, I you're digging in this tragedy, and at the same time you give me the the, the space to reflect, to, to to move around. The camera is moving around and I'm moving around as well. So this deep respect of me as spectator makes possible for me and for us, I guess, to to yeah, to 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 understand this 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 
unimaginable uh, uh, tragedy happened in Sabra Shatila. So, yeah. I would say it in another way. This was really the process of editing how you can, uh, and how is it possible that uh, you watch such a film uh, where the horror is described. I mean, I will, and it was really the question of the editing. I will give one example. Originally, we didn't want that the film will end with the scene of the knife. And uh, I had in mind another scene with the guy of the cats, for example. And uh, we, ha we tried very hard and very long, but after the scene with the knife, nothing could anymore work. So it became automatically clear that this is a climax and this scene, if we want to use it in the film, it has to be in the end. So it was, it's really uh, what you are describing as this freedom of reflection, it's, uh, it's coming through the editing. And there also our editor, Anne Mo, uh, who was some uh, very close friend, somebody who left, was living for years in Beirut, she had a major role. Catherine. Oui, moi je voulais dire que Lokman Slim pensait que euh, le Liban ne pourrait pas se sortir de ses fantômes de sa guerre civile euh, sans revisiter son passé. Et que finalement ce film fait partie d'un processus. Parce qu'en donnant la parole euh, aux bourreaux, en, en, en donnant la parole à des bourreaux qui racontent la vérité crue, atroce, mais aussi combien banale d'une guerre. Et euh, finalement, cela permet de comprendre, pas de comprendre, c'est-à-dire de ne pas juger, mais de comprendre comment les choses se passent dans l'esprit d'un bourreau, comme Monica et Lockman, vous avez aussi fait ce film sur les victimes, comment ça se passe pour les victimes. Et je pense personnellement, et c'est ça, je pense, qui a intéressé le festival, euh, qui a d'ailleurs euh, accueilli Lockman avec euh, Ricardo Bocco de Graduate Institute il y a quelques années. Ce qui a intéressé le festival, c'est au fond cette démarche, ce processus où, où on peut comprendre et, et, et le fait de comprendre permet au bout du compte la réconciliation. C'est ça qui y a au bout de cette histoire. Malheureusement, euh, si ce film était projeté au Liban, je pense qu'il pourrait servir. Et c'est là, c'est bien dommage. Voilà, c'est tout ce que j'avais à dire. Just to act there, I mean, uh, as uh, the film doesn't show the faces, and when we showed, the, when we screened the film or showed the film in September 2005 in Lebanon. Uh, is there were around 700 spectators, and uh, among them were also survivors of the massacre. So at one point, I was really afraid uh, that they would pressure us to reveal the identity of these men, and it didn't happen. They were, in a very strange way, almost in brackets, relieved. It's a terrible word to say, because um, finally the perpetrators, perpetrators were confirming what they have been telling for years. So this was this kind of relief. Yes, I mean, it, what we were telling you since years, it really has happened and the perpetrators are confirming it. In and French, this is very important uh, so, uh, for the victims. In all processes of transitional justice, once the perpetrators confirm what the victims say, it turns to another story. Une, 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 une citation, enfin, une, 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 un rappel, euh, quand on parle de la mémoire, la mémoire vive, et j'ai une citation, la mémoire vive exige l'oubli. Et il y a quelque chose de très intéressant sur le plan psychologique, psychanalytique, de, du rapport entre la mémoire, et qui paradoxalement permet un oubli momentané au moins. To reconcile, you need not only to uh, to keep the memory of a number of events, people and facts, but you need to forget 
some parts. This was what was basically um, Renan, the famous uh, French philosopher, said at the end of the 19th century, talking about nationalism, nationalism and unity in France. To be a nation, we the French, we not only have to remember, but we have to decide what we need to forget to keep united. Absolutely. Um, there are uh, two questions. Uh, Mrs. Uh, uh, Nouradine, the uh, ambassador of Lebanon in Bern, here. Thank you. Um, I think what was mostly troubling for me seeing this documentary was the cold-bloodedness that we could feel. Probably this is a very good uh, translation of what had happened then. I mean, the perpetrators are describing the cold-bloodedness that was there in the killing. But what, tr what troubled me, and I don't know if I, maybe I misperceived it, I felt that the cold-bloodedness was still there. Like, for example, a comment like when he said, I saw horses dead, and I realized that in war there's no difference. I mean, there's more like an indignation in front of the deaths of the horse. I was even scared if I were you when at the end he describes the way that he would kill with a knife and he tells you, imagine if I kill you. It's as if you are in front of somebody who might eventually kill you. I don't know if I um, explained my impression, but I had a feeling that maybe morally when we watch such, such documentaries, we expect a certain repentir mm -hmm. that I did not that I did not feel. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's your comment for that. Thanks. Very clear what you say. <laughs> yes, yeah. uh, there was another uh, question there. Thank you. Uh, it's more a question to you, Mr. Bocco, to Madame Kammerman and Mr. Perry. I think you must have seen this film several times now. And I'm interested in the different layers of the film, that maybe when you see it the first time, you are shocked, and you see it the second time, you see other things a third time. So I wonder if you can say something about, you know, how you experience the layers of the film and also kind of layers of being a human being that are shown in the film. Peut répondre, peut uh, ah, have a, there was a third uh, question. Uh, thank you for your film, first of all, because uh, it was, uh, I think, necessary. And uh, I just wanted to react on the question of the cold-bloodedness of um, the perpetrators of these crimes. Actually, I felt something very uh, disturbing, but in a very positive way. It's that there is a certain serenity, calm in this film. And uh, even when you talked about the body language of these guys, because I felt that even if the the, the picture was not perfect here in, on this screen, but the thing is, well, one guy that really marked me was the the one who's very skinny. I think it's the one we see here, which is. Uh, um, often in a green uh, setup, and this guy has a crazy body. I mean, he, I felt his body, and I was very uh, moved by him, but at the same time, I felt his cold-bloodedness, and he describes the most horrible crimes. I mean, he's, he, he could do it again. You feel it. When he tells it, he, he, it feels amusing for him to tell the story. And... I think it's the strength of the film, actually, because you don't try to uh, look for a pantier or something that shows him uh, like a sympathetic guy, but at the same time, he is human. He, he can't be anything else than human. And um, I think the, the question is not about the individuals in the film, but more about the, what the group made them do, because I don't think there is a... There is a how you say, um, espoir. Uh, there is a hope for this guy. But at the same time, I mean, he, he knows he won't be judged. We know it. And, uh, he, but it makes me feel good to, to see him say it. I mean, it's necessary for me because 
the, the crimes are horrible, but but the film is necessary. I mean, what we see here is like, it was very disturbing for me because I felt good watching the film. I felt like it was a almost spiritual film, you know? And that's what I wanted to say, just a, it Thank wasn't you. a question. Thank you. There is a last question over there, and then uh, we come back to the panel. Thank you. Yes, I, I, I want to come back to this question uh, about uh, repentance. Uh, did you get a sense when you were interviewing these men that they did believe that what they did was wrong? They all, I believe, uh, justified it, why they did it. They, they all had a clear explanation about why they did it. It was for revenge of Jemayat, his assassination. They didn't understand why but they felt that there was a reason for it. But at the same time, they, as we have been saying, they did it in a cold-blooded way, and they, you know, just the first one was easy, or, or difficult, but the subsequent ones were easier, and it got easier and easier as the, the time went on. And that's what I really want to get a sense. The, the, if they did repent it, they, they obviously, at least some of them, uh, had strong emotions still about it and nightmares or thoughts about it that disturbed them. Um, but you talk about the, the climax of the film at the end when the man describes how killing with a knife is better because you kill more than once. It's killing three times because it's so horrendous and painful. I didn't get a sense that he regretted what he did. And I want to know if you really had a sense that any of them repented it, some of them did, or none of them, that it was just they were monsters, they were programmed, they were robots given orders, they executed their orders, and their job was done. Thank you. Maybe I, I just like to intervene a little bit, also making reference to uh, Lockman. Uh, the first time I invited Lockman uh, at the Institute was in 2012. At the time, I had been beginning to work on um, a project titled uh, Violence, Memory, and Cinema, uh, focused on, uh, in a comparative perspective, between Israel-Palestine, Lebanon for the Civil War, uh, uh, Chile and Argentina during the dictatorship. Now, with Lockman, uh, we began to highlight uh, common uh, say, uh, topics and ways in movies from those countries and beyond uh, portraying perpetrators. You have a good uh, uh, 20 movies about perpetrators that witness during uh, and after the dictatorship in Chile what they did in terms of torture. Even more, at least 30 movies on Argentina. Uh, think to uh, Riti Pan. He has made several movies. Dutch, one of the most famous one, on the uh, director of uh, S21, the famous prison uh, where more than 12,000 people were tortured and killed. Or Joshua Oppenheimer on his uh, two movies related to uh, the genocide in uh, uh, Indonesia, where they always interview uh, uh, the, the uh, perpetrators. And the perpetrators describe, sometimes in a very cold-blooded way, sometimes joyfully, hmm? because uh, if you go into details, for example, you have different traditions of torture or of killing in, during the Chilean dictatorship, uh, Torturers were using classical music. In Argentina, was rather a popular music, and especially French, uh, Dalida, etc., were their favorites during torture. In Indonesia, the favorite was rock um, uh, music from the States. So you even have these sub-traditions, and people, when they remember, when they were per perpetrating what they did, 
they are articulating different aspects and of camar camaraderie with all the people around. Huh? All the people around, meaning that, okay, there is the guy who tortured, but then you have the people who serve food to the tortured, who uh, uh, drag the bodies, the corpses, etc., etc. So you have all an infrastructure. It's, it's a system that works around. And in that case, I rarely saw people repenting. This is not the issue of repenting. Sorry. Yeah, I just would like to answer concerning the film. I mean, uh, no, there is no regret. And I mean, we have been often asked, uh, is it on purpose that you edited the film in the sense that there is no regret? And no, it was not on purpose. I mean, we have around 60 hours of rushes. Or, and in this 60 hours is no regret for the victims. And uh, what we have is, and I think the film is also showing it, is a kind of autopity. Yani, I have nightmares, I have... Uh, I, there is this nuage who is coming over me. Uh, it's, it's so difficult to talk. It would be easier to go to war. But this is not a, a regret for the victims. And um, I think the film is in this sense, unfortunately, also showing a certain kind of reality in Lebanon, uh, where I would say that the majority of uh, former fighters, whatever of uh, independently to which uh, fraction or community or militia they belonged, I don't think that they uh, really uh, regret. Because there is also, I mean, there are some, fam you have some famous examples in Lebanon. There is a person called Asa Cheftari who made a public mea culpa. But these kind of cases are very rare. So, uh, I, I, unfortunately, I think that uh, the Lamont, uh, Lamont du Regret, Lamont du Regret, yes. Uh, shows a kind of certain reality which is still prevailing in Lebanon. And just to answer your question briefly, very briefly, uh, watching the film many times, with you, I discovered the complexity of the situation because these guys are not alone. They are organized. It's a fantastic organization around them with Israel and, uh, and the Lebanese army. It's, it's a very professional organization and they are also part of it and tools, part tools of it. And you, you tell the story. It's a yeah. very complex yeah. story with different layers, as you say. And by the way, <clears throat> what uh, Monica just mentioned today is a famous film of Elian Rahab uh, titled The Sleepless Nights, which is the confrontation between Assad Shaftari and the mother of a young uh, um, guy who was uh, killed. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and in the movie, by the way, there is also Lockman, who is uh, part of the debate, uh, the documentary, uh, because of his work on the enforced disappearances in Lebanon. Sleepless, the Sleepless Nights is really a great movie not to be missed. We have it at our uh, library. Catherine. Oui, pour répondre à madame sur ce qu'on peut ressentir en regardant ce film plusieurs fois, euh, personnellement, je ressens presque toujours la même chose. Parce que cette réalité crue dont je parlais tout à l'heure, ce que j'appelle aussi cette banalité du mal, que j'ai vu pas seulement au Liban, mais étant reporter de guerre, et ayant quand même pas mal sillonné la planète... Euh, je la retrouve dans, comme le disait tout à l'heure Ricardo, je la retrouve dans beaucoup de situations et je ne veux pas m'y habituer. Je ne veux pas par principe parce que j'estime qu'être humain, c'est pouvoir euh, 
euh, non seulement analysé, comme le faisait Lockman, et j'aimais beaucoup cet esprit euh, pointu et critique qu'il avait, mais c'est aussi pouvoir se laisser euh, gagner par les émotions et pouvoir euh, se, pour, pour ne pas mourir, pour ne pas devenir un monstre froid, pour ne pas et c'est-à-dire ça fait partie de l'humanité. Donc non, je ressens toujours la même chose. Et je crois que je ressens toujours, je ressentirai toujours la même chose dans une situation de guerre et voilà. Merci. Uh, what I suggest now, uh, we have been talking uh, in different ways about uh, Lockman, but maybe some of you or many of you don't know him. Uh, it is too late to meet him, unluckily, but uh, we have a nine minutes uh, interview uh, with Lockman and Monica uh, in 2016. Uh, at, in Neon when they presented their uh, second movie, Tadmor. And this nine minutes uh, interview um, is very interesting because it will give you a full portrait of who Lockman was. So please, uh, if you are ready, we can uh, go uh, with the screening of this uh, short interview. On ne va pas raconter l'histoire en entier, mais disons que c'est un tout petit peu l'histoire de notre travail, d'une part, qui se focalise surtout sur la mémoire, sur la violence. Et c'est un tout petit peu l'histoire aussi de la région, euh, je veux dire du Liban et de la Syrie. Et donc euh, notre intérêt dans le sujet euh, des détenus en prison syrienne est un intérêt qui date... Euh, de plusieurs années. En 2012, euh, il s'est concrétisé par une coopération avec une association qui rassemble des anciens détenus libanais qui ont passé des, de longues années de prison en Syrie. Et c'est comme ça que la machine s'est mise à l'œuvre. Et petit à petit, euh, on est arrivé à euh, l'idée de travailler avec eux sur ce film. Et, juste pour ajouter, le film est aussi une sorte de continuation de notre premier film qui s'appelle « Massacre » et qui fait le portrait de six, euh, six hommes qui ont participé à la tuerie au massacre de Sabra et Shatila. Et, euh, disons, si le dernier film « Massacre » à chercher des réponses sur la violence collective via les bourreaux. Ce film-là cherche des réponses comment se vivre ce sort des atrocités. Euh, à part finalement euh, faire des films, euh, Monica et moi-même, animons une association qui s'appelle Oman Documentation et Recherche qui travaille depuis déjà une dizaine d'années sur ce triangle mémoire, euh, violence, présent. Et donc euh, euh, le travail filmique, euh, dirais-je, s'inscrit dans une sorte de, euh, de travail au quotidien qu'on dédie à ces trois thèmes dans leur actualité et non seulement dans leur euh, histoire. Et donc, euh, faire ce film, s'engager à faire ce film qui est en même temps euh, un témoignage euh, contre quelque chose, euh, contre euh, une sorte de, 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 de mal euh, banalisé, euh, parce que souvent sous-médiatisé est aussi un témoignage finalement pour ce travail euh, qui essaye de mettre ensemble euh, le passé et le présent et bien sûr euh, qui, euh, qui regarde vers le futur. Et j'ajouterai que nous vivons au Liban et de, depuis presque depuis cinq ans on, on est témoin ou on vit indirectement aussi au Liban la guerre en Syrie et euh, c'est 
Ces hommes-là étaient libérés en 2000. Euh, Peut-être pour eux, mais aussi pour nous, la nécessité de, de faire un film sur la torture, sur la survie, sur le secret de se vivre cette torture, euh, est devenu aussi une urgence. Le plus le, le, la guerre en Syrie est devenue violente. Et aujourd'hui, ces hommes-là, euh, qu'on qu voit dans le film, et qui retournent à leur passé, bien sûr, ils parlent pour eux, mais ils parlent aussi pour les 200 1000 détenus syriens dans les prisons syriennes. Je crois, nous, on a une préférence de, de créer notre, entre guillemets, notre propre réalité. Ça veut dire euh, l'approche esthétique suit un peu l'approche de notre previous film qui est Massacre, veut dire les deux films contiennent des interviews. Le film Tatmo a un autre élément qui n'est pas des interviews, mais pour rester sur les interviews, pour des raisons très différentes, mais les deux fois, on a tourné euh, les interviews dans les lieux plutôt anonymes, mais qui sont... Mais, qu'on peut identifier qu'ils sont situés dans une ville arabe, pas le son. Euh, bon, les raisons sont très différentes, mais je crois aussi que c'est une préférence esthétique. Maintenant, euh, l'autre partie est du film Tatmo, c'est le Reliving, Reenacting. Et là, c'est un travail euh, qui se fait en collaboration avec les détenus, les ex-détenus, euh, qui ont reconstitué leur prison ou leurs cellules individuelles et collectives. Oui, je dirais que finalement, euh, comme Monica l'a dit, que c'est un travail qui commence par collecter euh, des paroles, des témoignages et qui, à partir finalement de cette parole qui nous est confiée, on essaye de la porter euh, un peu plus loin qu'elle euh, ne veuille dire. Et ceci, finalement, c'est tout le travail qui se fait dans la salle de montage où finalement... Euh, on devient en quelque sorte euh, dans un on devient euh, les, les, les détenteurs de cette parole et en même temps ça devient notre responsabilité de la croiser de la mettre ensemble et comme elle l'a dit aussi dans le cas de Tadmor on est allé encore plus loin en laissant finalement la parole euh, devenir mouvement. Et ce mouvement s'est fait à travers ce qu'on appelle le « reliving » ou la répétition volontaire par les victimes même de ce qu'ils avaient vécu. Et bien sûr, pour vivre ou pour revivre ces moments-là, il fallait que ce groupe se scinde continuellement en victimes et en bourreaux. Donc on avait une sorte d'équipe d'hommes qui ont traversé la même expérience carcérale, mais qui étaient arrivés à une sorte de euh, cohésion qui lui permettait de temps à autre de se scinder et de euh, se remettre ensemble. Et ça, ça a fait une sorte de, je dirais, d'un un sort de ballet, que ce soit au niveau des témoignages ou bien euh, des gestes qui sont offerts de nouveau euh, à, à l'attention des spectateurs. Bon, pour nous, en tout cas, c'est un film euh, très universel dans le sens euh, que 
même si l'actualité, par exemple, en série, change, euh, le film garde son actualité. Mais comme euh, on est encore en guerre, et malgré, euh, malheureusement, ça n'a pas l'air de finir demain, euh, je crois qu'il ne faut juste pas oublier que ça, c'est exactement qu ce qu'on voit dans le film, et peut-être encore pire, ça se passe aujourd'hui et maintenant. Who better than uh, <coughs> Lokman and Monica uh, could describe uh, their own work as uh, filmmakers and uh, more than that, uh, especially with the nice French Lebanese accent uh, of uh, Lokman, very charming. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> not that I don't have an accent, but uh, I mean, with him I was joking because uh, if you are a Lebanese and you speak French, you will have a special pronunciation for the H. And then you will say, de hor, <laughs> not de hor, de hor. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it was very nice to joke with uh, uh, Lockman on uh, uh, the Lebanese French accent. <clears throat> um, yeah. Uh, two words again uh, on uh, on the movies to say, uh, first of all, uh, uh, tonight um, we are honored to have among us uh, the former ambassador to Lebanon, uh, Mrs. Ruth Flint. Um, and uh, I like to mention her presence also because uh, Switzerland has been behind uh, cultural production of different types, including cinema in Lebanon, and especially with issues related to dealing with the past. Dealing with the past is a brand or a trademark of a Swiss foreign policy uh, in many countries um, affected uh, by uh, wars, leaving political transition from authoritarian rule, or um, in after uh, civil wars. Actually, uh, the very expression dealing with the past was coined uh, in the late 90s by uh, then uh, uh, Peter Maurer, today the president of ICRC. At the time, he was the head of the fourth division of the Swiss Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, the project of working uh, on the dealing with the past was actually um, what Switzerland did as its specificity when Switzerland entered the UN. Huh? Switzerland entered the UN in the, in the early 2000s and uh, they brought uh, the notion and uh, all what goes around in terms of dealing with the past and transitional justice as a specific Swiss contribution. Thank you, Mrs. Ruth Flint, to be here. Um, and the work of Mrs. Flint has been pursued by Antoine Barras, uh, the ambassador that succeeded her and is going on. Switzerland, like uh, the European Union, like um, Germany, have been contributing to fund uh, uh, UMAM Documentation and Research Center. And I would also say thank you. Uh, tonight we have also in the public Irene Chalon. Uh, Irene Chalon, uh, she uh, has been for several years responsible of the um, documentary filmic archives of the uh, Swiss uh, television, the Swiss uh, French television. Um, and um, Irene has been as well contributed on behalf of the RTS to co-produce the second movie um, of uh, Lockman and um, Monica Tadmor. Thank you for being with us tonight, uh, Irene. Um, we have been speaking uh, quite a lot about uh, uh, the film uh, activities, the cinema activities of both you and... Uh, but uh, this is not the only uh, activity uh, that we 
have to remember for uh, what happened in the past, but also what happened in the future. So maybe it would be important in, if in a few minutes, uh, uh, Monica, you tell us a little bit uh, what are the structures now of the foundation, uh, Lockman Slim Founda Foundation, foundation, the uh, UMAM uh, uh, Documentation Research Center in Lebanon and now in Switzerland. Well, I will be try to be short. <coughs> Lukman uh, was somebody who had a lot of facets. So Lukman was not only a filmmaker, he was a publisher, he was a writer, he was, uh, uh, he was a political activist, he was a political commentator on, on TV, and he was so much more. And so it was somebody who had really many, many facets. After completing the film Massacre, we found it in 2005, our organization, Umam Documentation and Research. And uh, Lokman had a parallel activity, uh, which was another organization uh, called Hayabina, which worked mainly in Lebanon in the Shia milieu. And uh, trying to create alternatives to traditional parties. Um, then, I now, I mean, Lokman was in the south of Lebanon, uh, in a region where Hezbollah is dominant as a political factor, but also in a region which is under uh, unifil control. He was coldly, with six bullets, executed. And uh, we feel uh, what is clear for us that uh, they could kill him, whoever it was, but they cannot kill his ideas. And so the legacy of Lokman has to continue. And the legacy of Lokman will continue through our common work we have been doing, Omam documentation and research. But the legacy of Lokman will also continue to a newly created foundation, which is called the Lokman Slim Foundation. And the Lokman Slim Foundation will preserve and make known his writings, his library, the books he loved. But this foundation will also work on political assassinations in the MENA region and against the culture of impunity, which is also uh, waning in this region. Um, in, in the light of make uh, wanting since long time, and these were discussions Lukman and me had since very long time, in the light of, May, of the, our wish to make our work more known also outside of the Middle East, we voted uh, to found uh, Umam Switzerland uh, for several reasons. Some were mentioned by Ricardo. I mean, uh, Swiss, well, Switzerland is, is known for, for its activities, its wish of, uh, to push processes of dealing with the past. In the same time, we are part of a network here in Switzerland, which was launched by Swiss Peace and which is called Safe Heavens for Archives. And uh, this network is bringing together organizations like us, National Archives. Uh, it's, uh, it's, um, it's opening for network activities and, and, and. I don't want to go to all these details, <coughs> but these were the main two factors why we voted uh, to uh, have a sister organization in Switzerland. 
So um, the sister organization uh, was founded in a little bit difficult uh, conditions because of COVID-19 and we were unable to travel and uh, but it, uh, it's existing legally and today I'm on a very personal level um, because now, I mean, we are without Lokman. Uh, I was very, very moved by uh, a group of friends who are here be between us who contacted me and asked uh, what can we do and uh, also to preserve the legacy of Lokman. And finally, this is, Yani, they are here between us. Uh, this, uh, this is the new board of Omam Switzerland. Thank you. Um, and luckily, we are uh, reaching the end of this uh, event. Uh, uh, we are not disappearing, uh, we are just going up. Uh, we have to free uh, the room, uh, also the personnel uh, of the Institute, which has uh, assisted us uh, un uh, until now. Um, they will also enjoy uh, ending their uh, day. Um, I'd like to say two more uh, last things. Uh, one is that uh, uh, part of the archives uh, that are presently uh, scanned uh, in Beirut of Umam, uh, some of them uh, will also um, reach the Institute. And uh, for that, uh, I also wish to thank the cooperation of uh, the director of uh, our library and archives, Mr. Yves Corpato, uh, who is working with um, Monica and the staff uh, in Beirut uh, to follow up on this project. And another project uh, that we are setting up uh, is uh, a follow-up in collaboration with, uh, with Beirut with the Middle East and North Africa Prison Forum, which is uh, a, um, an initiative uh, <coughs> related to research webinar uh, publications on the present uh, carceral conditions in uh, uh, the Middle East and North Africa. And for this, uh, I'd like also to uh, thank uh, Gregoire Mallard, which is the research director of the Institute, who has been uh, immediately supporting the project. Uh, of course, uh, the German uh, GIZ, uh, who is funding uh, the Eva. work of two PhD students. Uh, that will be involved uh, in the uh, MENA Prison Forum uh, starting from uh, September this year. So, uh, beside uh, thanking uh, all of you for your time, ah, yes, please say. Yes, very shortly, it's important for all of us to understand that these archives means also pictures, also films, also sound material, also radio broadcastings. So it's a, a concept of audiovisual and um, legacy and, uh, and paper. Yeah. And with all the technical problems of digitalization and so on, but it's a big, a big amount of work, but including what we can hear and see. And this film is, of course, an important part of this archives we, we need, we need to understand. Important. And uh, if I may ask a yes. question, you, uh, we, we, I asked it before a little bit, but um, in, in cinema, when you have one shot and a second shot, uh, you can count, it's two shots, but it's not true. In cinema, you have one shot, editing, second shot, and then it creates a, a third, a third ID, a third meaning. And the question is very, easy, very simple question, uh, motivated by our mourning, by our emotion after the death of Lockman. Uh, both of you, you and him, him and you, you are working together one on one. But we, you, you have been three because of your commitment, political, political, poetic commitment uh, in 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 your in your daily life. So could you say some word about this kind of I don't know miracle of to be three because even though you are one or two um, it's very difficult 
Um, it's uh, we were completing each other. What was very beautiful, and I mean, I think somehow, uh, if you come by completing each other, through completing each other, I mean, we were able to to do our films. We were able to found Umam. Uh, we were able to have 20 wonderful years. Yeah. And uh, thank you, uh, Jean, for uh, having reminded about uh, the content of the archives and the audiovisual uh, part, which will certainly allow uh, to pursue a cooperation with uh, the International Oriental Film Festival Geneva, also on that uh, aspect of the archives. Um, I'd like to conclude uh, saying that, um, first of all, thank you for your presence. But as Jean said before, we could not clap at the end of the movie. But uh, I think we should clap in memory of Lockman and his work. Thank you again for your presence, and uh, we are moving upstairs. There is a possibility to keep uh, the conversation in a free and simple way. Thank you.